human energy, behavioral change, role of the outsider, seed scale model, four principles, seven goals, two dimensions of scaling. We've covered a tremendous amount of information, <clears throat> all of which that's designed to be able to give you a, a, an intensive and a broad look at the whole conversation. The last two major uh, uh, pieces of information that we're gonna need to cover are holism and sustainability, okay? And um, <clears throat> holism is gonna refer to making sure that we're working from a holistic perspective. Sustainability, naturally and obviously, is referring to the actual sustainable nature of the work that we're doing with a couple of tips to be able to increase our sustainability in our programming. <clears throat> holism, all right? This is the icon that we're gonna use to represent holism. We're gonna go in here. Complex problems require comprehensive solutions. Okay, so if these problems that we were dealing with was some small little isolated thing, then maybe some small little isolated solution might do just fine. <clears throat> when we're dealing with issues that are massively complex. The issues are integrated with each other and they are coming together synergistically to create these emergent results we've got to deal with. Then the only way that we're going to be able to realistically address that conversation in any productive way is for us to be able to look at the whole of the conversation. Okay, uh, at a conference of development agencies in East Africa it was said it is important to avoid training people in, say, just agricultural skills without also teaching them how to improve their minds, their homes, their health, their villages, and beyond. <clears throat> it's my own little quote here. A butterfly that flaps its wings on one side of the system will affect the whole system. Okay, You've obviously heard this little Eastern influence right here. But now that we're looking at it from a systems approach, we see that it's actually, it's all connected. And as a community development agent or an outsider, the more that we can have a respect and a reverence for the fact that oh, pretty much everything's all connected, then we're gonna approach the, what we're, we're gonna approach the development setting as a system that's comprised of all these different parts that are all a part of one system rather than a whole bunch of individual and autonomous parts. And that perspective is going to set us up for success. The definition of holism, the theory that the parts of a whole are an intimate interconnection such that they cannot exist or be understood independent of that whole. Okay. Now there's always going to be parts. HIV issue is an HIV issue. And you might be able to understand the biology of the disease by being a scientist that understands the biology of that disease. But to understand what the issue really is, why it's pervasive, how it affects people's lives, what needs to be taken into consideration in looking at potential solutions for it, we need to see that that HIV issue cannot be seen without us fully understanding the entirety of the experience of someone that's living in extreme poverty and all the different aspects of that experience that are coming together and interacting with each other. Use a car example to understand holism. Now, in, in all reality, and don't look for the, the little, little aspects here that we could find criticism in the analogy, but in all reality, it doesn't really add us any value to understand how the brakes work or how the radiator works all by itself because brake pads have very little intrinsic value if they're not a part of a whole that's able to have all these different aspects of it that are working together and functioning. And so, and even as a mechanic, you can't really address a radiator issue if you don't understand how the engine works. Because all those things are connected together and you can't see one thing as an independent, um, autonomous situation. So look at this car diagram, noticing all the different parts of the car, and we need to understand that it's a car and there's all these parts of the car that are working together, as opposed to just all these individual parts that we might want to, from a reductionist perspective, understand independently. Okay. Again, reminding the fact that poverty is, um, 
is like a tree and we look at each individual issue and we get a, a more holistic understanding of it. I'll give you one example. Um, sex for fish is a common phrase in uh, western Kenya on the edge of Lake Victoria. Um, we see that the fishing industry and the gender inequality conversation and the pandemics and the economic development and the environmental degradation, they've all come together to make uh, HIV become even more of a rampant issue in these areas of Kenya. Because what happens is the men um, that are catching the fish are having, um, th the women that are typically purchasing the fish from the men that are catching them um, might not have all the funds and the resources to be able to purchase that or there might be competition in purchasing for that fish so that a woman actually has to throw her body on the table as a bargaining chip to be able to purchase the fish from the fishermen and it doesn't even stop right there then she has to throw her body on the table again to be able to get the truck driver to transport her fish to the local market and then she might have to put her body on the table again to get somebody to be able to buy those dried fish from her and so um, sex has been so incorporated into the fishing industry that it's resulted in all these this this web of connections that spread the virus rapidly in that area um, we also see that when we're looking at orphans and vulnerable children that there's more and more in this region because more and more of the parents are dying from HIV um, as the as the fisheries become depleted in Lake Victoria there becomes more and more competition for the fish, making some of these practices becoming more and more and more relevant and necessary for the women to be able to survive. As the women aren't literate and don't have an education, they may not have other opportunities for themselves. They might not know how to be able to farm or, 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 or garden on their own, and so they become dependent upon this type of a thing. So if we want to step into the situation and say, okay, great, we're going to solve the AIDS problem, and we're going to solve that problem by teaching about how the disease is spread um, and by giving out condoms, then we think that maybe we're going to solve the problem. And it just so happens that the man's not going to give the woman the fish if he has to use a condom. Well, we have to understand all the different dimensions that are going on and recognize that once we, when we see it just at the HIV level, we might think that the solution revolves around educating women about how they get HIV. But you could have an education campaign all day long, and if the woman and her children are still hungry, then a long-term potential problem has no bearing to a short-term immediate survival problem. Because what does it matter if I'm alive 20 years from now if I starve today? So we, now that we see the sex for fish, the, the HIV issue from a little bit more of a holistic perspective because we've understood a lot of these different issues, then we actually recognize that a lot of the solutions revolve around women's uh, vocational training, women's literacy, business training, economic development, agricultural training for women. All the things that would actually remove their dependencies upon these types of behaviors as their only way to be able to survive. You know, um, another example that I'll give you is I. Um, I was able to spend about two weeks in northern Kenya and I was studying a conflict between the, Turcon the Tur Turkanas and the Pakots. That's two tribes that have been um, at war with each other. Or th there's been intertribal conflict for a while and while I was there, there was almost one killing per day. And um, it, was, it was a resource issue and it was a scarcity issue and it was a poverty issue because the Turkanas had really th the more fertile soil that they'd been able to claim that land. And the Pakots, they were, they were goat herders. And their goats didn't have the vegetation they needed to be able to survive. So the goats were dying and the people were starving. And when I, I spent a lot of my time with the Turkanas, and the whole message revolved around how evil the Pakots were, because the Pakots were doing most of the raiding and most of the killing. The Pakots were the bad guys, they were the bad guys, they were the bad guys. Well, I crossed enemy lines. Much to the dismay of a lot of my Turkana friends, I said, I'm going to go hang out with the Pakots, these bad guys, and see what they have to say. So I went over to their region. I lived with them for several days. I talked to them all about the problems. And guess what they told me? They told me that, let me, let, let me tell you what happens. What happens is a Pakot woman is holding her child. And she doesn't even have the breast milk to be able to feed the, feed the child. And she's hungry, and the child's hungry. 
And she looks at her husband and she says, what are you going to do about this? So now we see that this, these terrible, violent people that are causing this conflict, it's really a, a desperate desire for survival and providing for family members. So when we, when we look into the entirety of the conversation, we see that this isn't about conflict resolution. This isn't about bringing in the UN troops and, and being able to guard the land and punish the perpetrators. This is about business training, other opportunities, economic development, um, uh, and a number of other things that are going to be able to actually eliminate the root issues that are driving towards this violent conflict. So the more that we can understand an issue from a holistic perspective, the more that we're going to be able to, to, um, to, to uh, approach it as such. The traditional development model works in what we call development silos. Okay? So they say, my organization says, we do business development. Another says, well, we do water and sanitation. Another says, we do women's empowerment. And a fourth says, we do agricultural development. Well, a lot of these people are actually working in and competing in the same region for attention, for volunteers, for donor funding, and for a lot of other things. So they, they literally are competing with each other to show that what they're doing is more effective than what others are doing. And I'm not saying that every organization in this category, but just to kind of as a blanket statement for the traditional development model, it works within development silos. A grant is given for an organization to be able to spend $500,000 in one of these specific areas, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We, we see that just the way the, the, the model's presently set up is it's through these development silos. Well, if these issues are holistic issues, if they're all interconnected, then how can we be able to really feel like we're making enormous strides if we're just looking at and focusing within one of those spaces? And if we're competing with each, with each other to say, oh no, our problem is the most important problem. Give us the grant. Oh no, 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 our problem is the most important problem. It's one problem. They're all connected. Okay, so that's a little bit of an overview about holism. Um, a little bit of tips on how to and the benefits of, we'll go through. Um, it, 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 they're all connected, okay? You guys got that. Um, the, the second thing is, is when, and when we understand the holistic nature of the problems that we're working with, then it sets us up to actually address multiple issues simultaneously. Sometimes there's one thing that we can do that actually can address many root issues. Another time, if that might, might not be the case, at least we can address um, a number of things concurrently so that simultaneously refers to developing one program that addresses a number of issues. Concurrently means we're addressing a number of different programs that, that address different issues, but the, in the addressing of those different issues, it's gonna work together to help us to be able to achieve our end result. So I'll give you an example of concurrently, as we're working with farmers, we're talking about a number of different types of, of, of soil fertility, one of which is actually human waste composting. As we're working with the community, we're talking about sanitation improvement. We're talking about what are we doing with our human waste? Well, those are, that's, we're, we're concurrently working at the same issue to actually organize our human waste that is used more responsibly and less dangerously. We see the entire development system, uh, the development landscape as one system um, in so much that in order for the whole system to work well, not only do all the different parts need to work effectively, but all the different parts need to work in relationship to each other. And I've actually just evolved, I've just moved from talking about extreme poverty to now talking about the development landscape. So now we're talking about the different organizations and the different programs that are all working towards these ends and that there needs to be a, a holistic perspective at looking at those programs so they can also be working together effectively. This is another Roland Bunch quote. If every new agency that begins work in a country must reinvent the wheel, we will all accomplish very little. Even more deplorable is the tendency of some agencies to try to compete with everyone else usually by providing more paternalistic services in order to attract more members to their organizations. Many villagers notice rather quickly the hypocrisy of a development agency that exhorts them to cooperate with each other while the agency fails to cooperate with other agencies. Development agencies must learn, must learn from each other's experience and coordinate efforts. 
So now we're moving into a call for as outsiders and as community development agents to not only see the poverty conversation holistically, but also to see the development landscape, all the players that are involved with that poverty conversation and see them as all parts of one whole. And when we, see, when, we, when, we, when we strive to see it from that perspective, we quickly recognize where that hole isn't working properly. We quickly realize where those organizations aren't talking to each other and, um, and where there's room for improvement. And that's part of the role of an outsider is to serve in the, in the catalyzing of this, type, of this dimension of the development conversation also. Uh, another tip in, in, in addressing holism is to look for the intersections. Okay? And what I mean by intersections is where the different issues clearly overlap. Okay? Um, like for example, in, in the story of sex, for, uh, uh, of, of sex for Fish, or Fish for Sex, um, the HIV conversation, which could be seen as one development silo, and the business development conversation could be seen as another development silo. Well, as I say this sentence, women are, 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 um, are becoming infected with HIV because they have a lack of business opportunities and are using their bodies as their primary source of economic gain. Well, when we see HIV and business development in the same sentence, then we need to make sure that the organizations that are representing HIV development and the organizations that are representing business development are working together on the same problem. Or even more clearly, which also might not be happening, is organizations might have various development silos represented within their programming that aren't talking to each other. So maybe one organization has an HIV wing and a business development wing, but they're not even working together to make sure that the women that are getting the HIV education are also getting the business development training and are then more equipped to be able to fight the HIV issue that they're dealing with. So we can see this with sanitation and agriculture. I gave you that example a minute ago. We can see it with women's empowerment and literacy. We've talked about that a little bit today. And uh, women's health and, 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 and educational development and, and school attendance. You know, when we see the sentence that um, many 13-year-old girls are dropping out of school because they're absent from school for a week every month because of their menstrual cycle. Well, now all of a sudden, let's get the women's health people and the, and the, and the education people talking together to make sure that we're working out solutions. Another pace we're looking for intersections is through capacities, which I'll just go over quickly, but essentially it's the same type of thing. So organizations that have capacity to work in these types of areas, and when we see those things overlap, that means that there needs to be a conversation there. So those organizations are in some ways collaborating and coordinating efforts. And this could involve NGO programs, um, both international and domestic NGOs, CBOs, which is a community-based organization, um, local social entrepreneurs, corporations, religious organizations, government agencies, and as I mentioned a minute ago, intra and inter organizational holism, meaning that organizations within themselves, their various different programs are talking to each other, and then organizations within each other are all working and talking to each other. So you can see that so many of these principles are the same, whether we're talking about working with the development landscape and the players that are working towards poverty alleviation, as well as when we're working in poverty alleviation, right? We talked about connections. Communities need to be connected within each other better and to each other better. The exact same principles. Um, and an intersection gives us a clue for increased holism. So when we see that there's some type of intersection where one program in one organization is doing something similar to another program in another organization, then there should be a conversation so that we can work together as a holistic system and not as individual players. The same exact thing at the community level. When different community members have different interests of making their community a better place, let's make sure that they're talking to each other and working together. All right. So that's some of the, 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 the major tasks. I'm going to go quickly through some of the benefits, which I think are fairly, fairly straightforward. In looking at it from a holistic perspective, we're able to increase our effectiveness and our efficiency. Right. Uh, so many development programs, myself included, we, we get into a development situation where we think we've got it all figured out. And we quickly find out that if you look at the load in the back of the truck, we imagine, oh, that's about how much work we've got to do to solve this problem. And then quickly recognize, ooh, I, uh, we underestimated how much work there was going to be to solve that problem, right? <laughs> and so we can help to 
support each other as development agencies. I've got this funding, I've got this expert, I've got this expertise, we've got these resources. Okay, great. Now we've got all the, the needed uh, ingredients to support these communities in massive transformation. Okay. Synergies allow greater impact. There's some, don't quote me on this, but it's something like one horse can pull five tons worth of weight and two horses can pull 25 ton, ton, tons worth of weight, something kind of like that. Where, you, where the, the, the sum, as you guys know this quote, or the whole is much greater than the sum of its parts. So by working together, we can achieve way more than we would be able to achieve by working independently and then adding those efforts together because of all the things we've talked about so far. And lastly, like the other things, it's resulting in a stronger development system. So the landscape, the players, the NGOs, the government agencies that are working towards poverty alleviation, they're actually becoming stronger in their capacity to do that work because we're seeing it from a holistic perspective and we're seeing that those aren't just individual autonomous entities operating in their own space, but that they are and should be seen as various different organs of one, of one body. Okay, so those are some of the, um, the how-tos and, the, um, and the benefits of. Lastly, I want to bring us back to the um, Palin story, okay, where we saw the spillover. We saw that sanitation improvement quickly led to women's empowerment, which led to increase in water supply, which led to agricultural development, which led to income generation activities. So we've talked about the rising, the revolution of rising aspirations, we've talked about a number of other things, but now when we see it from this holistic perspective, we see that not only do they t t t connect to each other, but they will necessarily connect to each other and they'll spill over. So I want to introduce you to the term, that's what spillover refers to, is one initiative spilling over into another initiative. The other thing is the reinforcement that happens because we see that not only are they spilling over, but one initiative is actually making the other initiative easier to be successful. Because now that we have more access to clean water, now that we're farming better, now that we've solved our sanitation problems, it's easier for us to do this, it's easier for us to do this, that and the other thing. So the various different programs reinforce each other. And we see that clearly when we look at it from a holistic perspective. Okay. <clears throat> the, last, the, the second to last thing that I'll say about holism is that the notion of holism itself, it's not novel, okay, or revolutionary, but how we define the whole is. Okay. So that's what's revolutionary, is how we decide to define the whole. What I mean by that, well let me go into here real quick. When we see the entire thing as one giant system that we, uh, that we can have a massive influence on the system by addressing the relationships between all the parts rather than trying to change the parts themselves. Let me come back into this part and I'll hit that again. When we see the system now as the needs that people in, in impoverished situations have with the efforts that were involved with in, in supporting them, the ones that are internal, external, all the efforts that are being developed to be able to address those needs, and then all the players that are existing, the social entrepreneurs that are coming out of the communities, the NGOs, the government agencies, the corporations that want to make a social impact, et cetera, et cetera. When we see this as the whole, when this is the way that we define the whole, then it opens up all these new opportunities. And this is what I would encourage and leave with you regarding holism is that the holism of the development environment is the needs and the efforts and the players and how all of those things not only interact with each other respectively, but interact within each other. So players are interacting with each other, the needs, the root issues are interacting with each other, the various different efforts are having different impacts, so those are interacting with each other and then interacting with the various different categories, okay? Again, not that this right here is going to empower you to step in and transform the whole development environment, but at least by seeing it from this perspective will set you up to be able to recognize what environment you really find yourself in 
and how you can help to tweak that environment and that holistic development whole to be able to be more effective in meeting the needs of the people. Okay. And lastly, comprehensive cross-sector, cross-industry action is too complex to plan and implement, but straightforward to grow. So comprehensive and cross-sector mean that we're addressing all the different issues within poverty, comma, cross-industry, meaning now we're bringing all the different players together. Comprehensive cross-sector, cross-industry action is too complex to plan and implement, but it's straightforward to grow. So by employing the four principles, seven goals, and two dimensions of scaling, you will, it can inevitably, it, 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 if done right and effectively, and if the circumstances are right, it will result in comprehensive cross-sector, cross-industry action. But we can't just formulate that. We have to grow it through certain principles. And then relationships are able to be created which allow all of this to be able to work. And it takes, and, and when we talk about comprehensive cross-sector, cross-industry action, now we went from 10,000 variables to 10,000 times 10,000 variables. Okay. And that's essentially what the seed scale model is designed to be able to do. So that's our overview of holism and that conversation of holism. And just a reminder that this becomes a perspective or a paradigm that we bring with ourselves into the development equation um, in order to make sure that we are supporting the environment um, in, in, in addressing our ultimate missions, which are to increase quality of life um, in the sectors that we're working in.